This is going to be a fantastic sister to sister. Amy, people write us questions, and one person said, what does submission to God really mean? Great question, and also, what does it mean to be a virtuous woman, and when did you feel the closest to God in your life? Oh my gosh, the sisters are gonna talk about it. Well, hello and welcome to Sister to Sister. We're so glad you joined us today. It's gonna to be a very interesting show. You send us questions and we answer from a biblical point of view. So I'm gonna get right to it because we have really good question today. Oh my gosh, Corey, <laughs> I'm coming to you. This is so good. What does it mean and what does it not mean to be a virtuous woman? This well, is good. First of all, my name Corey means virtuous maiden. Oh, I thought it was after Corey Ten Bloom. Well, no, it is, but the name Corey means virtuous maiden. Oh, so that, okay. I, yeah. Oh, so I so always that's your love question. That. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I looked up in Proverbs 31 because we have the Proverbs 31 woman, mm -hmm. and in verse 10 it starts to talk about what is a virtuous woman? So let's look straight to the word for what is a virtuous woman. And um, you know, it tells us that a, a virtuous woman is worth more than rubies, okay? So what is virtue or what is, a, what is virtuous mean? It is behavior or showing or having right. high moral standards. Right. Oh, that is what mm -hmm. Virtue good. is or virtuous. You know, we hear mm. patience is a virtue. So, you know, what is it? It's having high moral standards. And then we have wow. we have a description of that in Proverbs 31. And you and that description is so I love it. It's so beautiful. It's it talks about her strength. It talks about being busy, being successful, being hardworking. Mm -hmm. Do you know what it doesn't talk about? You know what it isn't? No, come on. Tell us. It's not demure. It's not a woman that is meek and mild and, and sitting there in the background. The description of that virtuous woman in Proverbs 31, she is out there. She is twice in that scripture passage, it talks about her strength. I mean, it, it, this woman is not a woman that is hiding in the background, okay? Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I want people to look, when they're looking for a virtuous woman, mm -hmm. go to God's word and see what right. it says about a virtuous Does woman. Does everybody agree with that about the meek? Because I think of, to be honest, and I know she was strong, but I think of Mother Teresa. She wasn't not in the background, but she was very, she was a quiet spirit. So I don't know if I well, um, meekness agree with is that. strength yeah. under control. Yeah. So right, right. it doesn't mean because you're right. meek, you're weak. Yeah. It means okay. actually you're really, really strong. Yeah, that's there you go. But right. I want to go into the backstory of who wrote about the virtuous woman, which would be Solomon's mother, which would be Bathsheba. Yes. Okay, let's talk about Bathsheba bathing naked at the right time where King David <laughs> would be just out on his balcony. She did it all wrong. Look, okay. Oh, and then he summoned her. She could have said no. She goes, she sleeps with him. They have a baby out of wedlock. Her husband is now on the front line. He dies. I mean, there's a lot of backstory, but that's what's so amazing about it that's because cool. of God's redemption yes. and God's grace that it's like no matter where you were or who you, what you did or what happened, God's grace and, and blessing and mercy and kindness can totally change your life yeah. where all of a sudden she's writing about this godly woman, this virtuous woman, and telling her son, this is what you should look for in a woman. So I think, wow. you know, we're not all there right. yet, right. but we all, by the grace of God, can grow to become that woman. Mm -hmm. Does yes. anybody else have a, anything on virtue? Because I loved the actual definition, which is high morals. Yeah, I, I think too, when I look at this, <clears throat> I always examine my foundation. Jesus says, build your house on a rock. Don't build your house on the worldly things, on sand. Mm -hmm. So I encourage women, look at what your foundation is. Mm -hmm. Are you saved? 
Do you have the Holy Spirit in your life? Are you working on the fundamentals, studying, praying, reading, and, and building that That's right. foundation? That's right. Because you could have all these beautiful things on top and great personalities, right. but if your foundation isn't sure, Jesus said, when the wind blows and the rain comes, you're gonna be washed away. Right. And the other thing I wanna say is God like works on one thing at a time with me. I was telling you about, <laughs> I, I talk too much or, you know, I open my mouth too soon and he's putting a guard on me. What is God telling you? Right. The one thing yes. you need to change so before good. you go on to the other. What's it say? Line upon line. Mm. Pre we're not gonna all arrive, as Amy said, we're not gonna arrive to all these beautiful right. things that Bathsheba talks about, mm -hmm. but we can build one, yes. work on that yeah. one thing. Yes. Right, well, I'm gonna go, I, I love this, but I'm gonna go to the next question because it's, it's really good too. Thank you for this one. And you write, when in your life did you feel closest to God, sisters? Someone wants to know about us. Yeah. Um, I, I really did a deep search because there are those hard, painful, traumatic moments where you're just pressing into God, but there's also moments where God is opening a unique door of opportunity. Paul said, a great and effectual door is opening it, but there are many adversaries. So I said right now, because we have to hear so clearly, so specifically, like we cannot listen at all to anything that is, uh, you know, crazy books, random movies. I mean, we have to be so strategic right. right now. We cannot miss this great and effectual opportunity that could lead our church to being a hundred year church. It's like that important. Plus a lot of people are following you. You're, you're moving the sheep somewhere. Things are happening with, you know, government and church and, and opportunities and we cannot miss it. So I would say more than ever, you know, both for my husband and I, I mean, we have blinders on and we are listening to God with right now. all that we are right, right now. What about you? What, yes. when have you felt closest to God? Because you've had so good, my, you've had bad. Exactly, and so my mind went to a totally mm -hmm. different, different place, but with much respect, she's talking about where she's at right now. For, for me, when the question comes, when did you feel the closest to God, I would, have to be honest and, and transparent and say in my most difficult times. Now, but there's two sides to that. Sometimes there has been, I've been in some difficult seasons and the grace of God yes. mm -hmm. was just on me. Mm -hmm. The gift of faith mm -hmm. was just present yes. and I could press through and it would have been something that ordinarily you could have collapsed, fallen apart, right. had a nervous breakdown. And then there were times that I dealt with depression. I had to go for, th for therapy. All the stuff that we right. as believers think is just too much. You pray it away, shout it away, you know. Um, so I had to walk through that. And I was closest to the Lord and one of my times, closest because I had to lean on God because it was against everything that I had even been groomed or trained for uh, spiritually. So I had to open myself up to the more excellent way. Right. This you ought to have done, but not left the other undone. Yes. Then there were times that I didn't feel him, but he was right there. An example, got hit by a drunk driver. I wanted, if I had to, I wanted to bring the picture, mm. but um, the car went airborne, flipped three times, landed on its roof. They had to cut me out with the jaws of life. Jesus. It was on the news and everything. And, um, and yet I came out without a scratch, not even so right. much as a cut wow. from the glass. Mm. Now in that moment, That's while so somebody funny. was trying to help me out the car, he, he says, you're so calm. And I'm not gonna pretend like, oh, I just felt, the, you know, no, it was just the grace of God, yes. you know what I mean? Yes. And um, I wound up praying for the guy that was trying to get me wow. out. You know, I'm wow. laying hands on him and praying for him. But I can so tell cool. you when I felt it, physically felt it, is too, sometimes when you look back and it's like, wow, yeah. I yeah. came out of there, I wasn't cut. There was glass in my hair. There was not a cut on my wow. scalp, not just, you know, of course I had to go that through therapy so and all of that, you know, and I wound up with a, I was dealing with a concussion, but I mean, yeah. 
outside that of that. So I mean, good. no broken bones. Oh, that so is so, so good. Yeah. good. That's Corey, our flow. Yeah. Yeah. Mine's a little bit different. I, when I think back and think when was I closest to God is when my babies were newborns, um, you, you, I had to spend a lot of time just sitting and not doing anything when I would be nursing them. And so I would always grab my water and my Bible and I spent a lot of time in the word. Mm -hmm. And when you're reading God's word, you are just gonna get closer to the Lord, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'm not trying to be hyper spiritualized or be like, I was just this amazing mom. Mm -hmm. It was just, I was really tired mm -hmm. and I was forced to sit there for long periods of time. Mm -hmm. And I'm just staring into this face of this creation, uh, you know, this, this amazing little newborn. and. I'm reading God's word and it just was a time where I just really felt God's closeness mm -hmm. to me. That's and it so was a good. really special time. That's so good. Mm -hmm. And instead of going with your closest to God, yes. because I know you probably have one, I do want the people to understand this last question. This is, I want them to hear yes. us. Okay, what do you say to someone who says, I don't believe in God because Christians are too judgmental? And this kind of piggybacks on, here we are with all this God moment, but why do they think we're judgmental? I, this is I our do, life. Yes, I do agree at times that Christians, once God cleans us up and purifies our hearts, we look at it from the perspective, oh wow, he's done so much, so we're looking right. at somebody else instead of looking in the mirror. I get it, but that's still an excuse. Yeah. God's not judgmental. Mm. You know, Jesus says, I have come not to call the righteous, I've come to call the sinner. I love the sinner. I've come not to judge the world, but to save the world. Don't let it be an excuse, because the scripture goes on to say, those who want to continue to walk in darkness, do it as an excuse. Come to the light. God is not judgmental. And we're going to talk about when he is and uh, later or think in another show. But God is not judgmental. And I have to say one more thing. You brought up Mother Teresa. And she says, any work of love brings us face to face with God. Come on. Amen. Amen. When we Christians are operating in love, the world can no longer look at us and say, but there are times when we operate in love and they think, I can't do that on my own. So they're That's thinking beautiful. we're judgmental. Mm. We're not judgmental. You can do it too. Only by the grace of God can you forgive. Only by the grace of God right. can you not swear. Right. Only by the grace of God can you not drink and do these superficial things. Yeah. But jealousy, anger, mm -hmm. hatred, mm -hmm. the things that are in the heart, he exposes mm -hmm. and he cleans. We can't do it ourselves. I know, yeah. but see, we think we're right. And this, we think we're right on so many areas of life. And we call out sin, we stand. So others think we are so judgmental. So let me jump in here. It's not even that we think we are right. There are things that we know we are right That's about. That's right, we are right. The, it's the attitude that I have achieved. Right. As Paul said, I don't preach and teach from a place of having obtained. And so for me to hold Corey accountable, or Corey to hold me accountable, that's a gift and a grace from God, but it's how we do it. We can rip each other apart right. or we can pull each other to the side and we can minister to one another in love, you know, and which will cause our hearts to open. God put a system in place for us to grow. We, we need, we have veered away from disciple making discipleship making. We have veered away from holding one another accountable. I don't want to hurt your feelings. I don't want you to feel bad. I don't want you not to like me. I don't want you to not have me back to speak. I don't want you to not refer me out to speak. But the bottom line is this is judgment work. So I don't minister so that you can like me. I like it. Who doesn't want to be liked? But I can't because that blood is now on my hands. And so I have to address what the word says but it's with the heart of God. Every gift works by love, not That's by right. pride, That's not right. by arrogance, not by self-promotion. It's a good one. Amy, how do you handle this? Um, I had a thought about when Paul said, I don't wanna take John Mark with me right now. We're parting ways. Well, why? Was he judgmental to John Mark? Did something happen? Mm -hmm. You know, but then all of a sudden he said, hey, now we're gonna work together. So 
there is such thing as good judgment, righteous judgment. Mm -hmm. Not It doesn't all have to be bad judgment. Right. It's like, I'm not judging you because I don't love you. I, I've got to assess the situation. I've got to, uh, what, we know them by their fruits. Know those who labor among you. I mean, we're not looking at apples and oranges here. We're looking at, you know, what does your life look like? What are you producing with your life? And, and let's, let's take a look at that. You know, I'm thinking specifically leadership in the church. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I think where this question comes in and it gets really tricky is when people come in and they're totally lost. Mm -hmm. They're not dressed right. They don't act like. They smell different, smell like weed, just drank alcohol. And for a Christian in that moment to judge the, them to feel like I don't love you or want Jesus, you to know the love of God, I think that is where a huge problem right. is. Well, I, I hope that you got our message today. <laughs> and we don't judge you. We just applaud you and are so grateful for you being here. Stay there. We've got more Sister to Sister. Hey, welcome back. You missed some good stuff while you were all getting coffee, but we're going to come back with even more insight from the Word of God and from our hearts. And this one, this is the wisdom of flow. I'm going to flow because this question, I'm not going to answer. I don't like it. What, I don't. <laughs> what frightens you what most as, as Christians or as a person? So I don't know if this is the wisdom of flow or the feelings of flow or the expression of flow, but what frighten flows the most is the condition and the heart of the church. I won't get into politics right now, but I, I, I have to address some of this because what has happened is the church has begun to allow the Lord, to, uh, not the Lord, but the world to be the leadership of the church. What do I mean by that? Yeah. There are things that we are looking to government to do that they have never been designed to do. It is the church's job to do it. And so as we begin to take a posture of fear, a posture of, you know, um, am I being ju judgmental? Mm -hmm. uh, you, I like the example you left us with on the last mm -hmm. question. A, a new believer comes in mm -hmm. uh, and she has on clothes that we wouldn't necessarily re recommend, but do I just hit them over the head with the word and you're dressed like a harlot and you're the, you know what I mean? Exactly. And, or yes. do I gracefully? Yes begin to work. It, and it may be mm. that I am to say nothing. I'm just to love that person and introduce them to the gift of the Holy Spirit by mm. my presence representing. Sometimes you are, and most likely you are the first Bible that a person reads, especially if you played a role in inviting them to the church. So now you're going to shift. I was good enough for you to invite me to the church, but now right. I, I, I got to fix my hair. I got to change my right. clothes. So there's a way, a way to, to go about uh, doing that. I think, you know, we talk about different things that in laws and legislation that we would love to see in place with our Judeo, Judeo, excuse me, Christian values. And I am not anti that. I'm just saying, are we supposed to look only or look so heavily to those in the political arena to do that? And my answer to that would be no. What do I base that on? Genesis. I am God's crown creation. The angels look at you and I and ask, what are we that God is so mindful of us? We are God's crown creation. He said, take dominion. Don't just be fruitful and multiply. He gave that to every living creature. But the only, what he gave to us was to take dominion, authorize, authorization to come in agreement with God. What we have done is we relinquished our authority to people who maybe don't even know how to steward that authority. And in the meantime, we have stepped back. People are asking, where is the church? Look at the Olympics. 
people were going, what, where's the church when things like this is happening? And the church has time to put a muzzle on their mouth because we don't want to not be popular. I don't want to answer certain questions on here because what you may think of me once I answer them, but I can't. I have to give what thus saith the Lord. For some people, they like that. They meet me, they go, wow, I really, I really like your, your, your answers. I, I like how you are. And with the thing, one of the biggest things that encourages me is when people meet me and they say, you're the same way. You're the exact same way. Well, yeah, I should be. I shouldn't put on a different face. You know, I'm not one face here and one face out there. If I stand for righteousness here, I'm going to stand for it out there. Well, that was a big frightened wow. thing. Sorry. But I do think that the church, <laughs> I do think that this, the church stood up during the Olympics. You though. know what's funny? To be honest, because I think what they did. frightens her the most excites me the most. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> True. I mean, True. I'm excited about it and I won't go in the whole, you know, government mm -hmm. executes righteousness mm -hmm. on behalf of the church. Mm -hmm. But uh, one thing, I, I actually have to struggle with a spirit of fear. Yes. It, it's a constant in my life and I don't know what, what it's rooted in. Maybe from my anxious mother, I don't know, that was just protective, but for my kids. Yeah. Every time they leave the house, I feel a spirit of fear. It's, it is insane. So I have to go back to the word and I, I haven't been given a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. So it's, it's crazy how the devil can come in with right. w that one area in your life. Maybe it's your health or your finances or your kids or, and just attack you. And it's like a relentless attack, yes. but you have to know that you win. That's right. There is victory on the other side of that, that it does not have to control you. It can shoot arrows and it can try to pierce you, but it does not have to dominate your life, but That's it is right. something. That's right. That I daily and, and deal with. And instead of, once again, instead of telling me about fear, I need you to tell me that when were you submissive to God, Roxy? When all right, all right. did you get through fear and submissive? Uh, yeah. Submit. I'll let fear go because I've got a myriad. I'm like my sister. Okay. Uh, this question hit me right between the eyes. I never, ever in my umpteen years or decades of being a Christian thought of submission to God. You don't think of it or you don't no, do it? No, this is, well, this is the thing. <laughs> I honor God. I follow him. How, this word is like, uh, you know, I'm doing something I don't want to do. A trigger mm -hmm. word. <laughs> you know, it, it's a trigger, it is a trigger word. It's like, I never thought of myself like that. First Samuel says, those that honor me, I will honor them. He died on the cross for me. He forgave me. He goes out and searches for the one who was lost. It's not like I'm I'm obligated. It's not like he says, you have to do this or, you know, it, I've never thought of this word and it rocked me when I saw this question. So all I could say is to, to people that are thinking about it, this, this is a love. This is a honoring right, out of right. love for what he did. How can I not follow him when it says he first loved me? He first died for me. It's not a submission that I have to do something against my will. He works in us both to will and, and to do, do his good pleasure. Good pleasure. So it might be a right question, but it's a question that in my, all my years of being a Christian, when I read it, it rocked my world. I never thought of God as this dutiful, I've got to do something I don't want to do. I mean, it occurs, but it's not like, it's out of love. It's out of honoring him. It's out of respecting him that I might do the things he asks me to do. And when he does, he brings other people along to encourage me to do what God wants to do. It's not a slave labor. It's a labor of love and desire to please him. Well, I'm th when I think of submit, I think we all hear from God in that quiet place. And then when he tells us something, do you do it? Good. Do you do it? I'm not sure. We're going to wrap this up. Stay right there. <laughs>
we were just talking about how we love to be submitted <laughs> to God, to those in authority, to our husbands. We're under the same mission, and we're under the same mission here at Cornerstone. We love the Word of God. We love the Bible. So let's read a scripture in Psalm 27, verses 7 and 8. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, will I seek. Now, I have to just give you a little background story. This is not David crying out in the hard times, in the war times, in the front line times, in the sorrowful times. This is David crying out to God before he's about to be anointed king. So this was actually a good season and a good time in his life. And what is he doing? Lord, it is your face that I want to seek. It is you that I'm crying out for. So let's get first things first and let's build and develop that real relationship with God before the storms, before the war, before the struggle, before the trials. Let's get first things first. And I promise you're going to see victory in your life. I love that we learned more about David today. We learned about Bathsheba and now you're speaking of David too as he spoke <laughs> in Psalms. And this is why we say this, as iron sharpens iron, so does the countenance of a man or a woman or a sister sharpen the other. And then I always say, you see, they make me a much better Kathy. See you next time.